Hey everybody, Jazzy here. Here is the year 28 recap for Thrill of the Grill, my solo Warly world over on Twitch. Just got back from about half of a season spent digging up most of the rocky turf in my cave system. And now I'm grinding out the cobble. I'm doing this while sitting on Wellington as an ironic reminder to myself how little I now rely on cobblestone for speed. Pretty sure that a beefalo doesn't move any faster on cobble. And considering I ride him around pretty much everywhere now, all of this expensive turf has sorta of lost some utility. It is nice for getting around my base while building though. And they do look like roads, so as far as looks go, they're still pretty important. I'm spending a bit of time finishing up the build around my main sinkhole, and continuing the work with Moon Dials, a staple of practically every jazzy build. Some viewers reminded me that I'm gonna have so much glass from these Moon Dials once I of the Storm drops and Moonstorms start to freeze some of this water into Moon Glass. I look forward to it! I'm just a little sad that apparently you can't keep the frozen water look after you kill the Celestial Champion. I had carried a couple of antline boulders upstairs just because we got some cave-ins near the exit and it was convenient to bring them topside. I'm placing a couple around the sinkhole as an experiment, but I'm not a big fan of the look, so I'm gonna try to find another spot to drop them. By the way, these boulders make great blockers for mob farms if you don't want to bother with statues. I'm trying out another Kloss fight on B-Flow this autumn. I think I prefer the Glossmer Saddle over the War Saddle for this fight for two reasons. The first is that it's much easier to dodge the Ice Cast, which is generally the hardest damage to avoid. I also have an easier time dodging the Lunge in Phase 2. It feels closer to the speed I get with the Magiluminescence. And because Kloss doesn't have a massive amount of HP, I don't mind hitting a little less hard in exchange for some extra speed. I actually started starving towards the end of the fight. And instead of breaking off to eat, I just ate a jelly bean instead. While starving, you lose about 1.25 health per second. And jelly beans restore 2 health every 2 seconds. So I'm only losing about a quarter of a point every second while the jelly bean is in effect. And that gives me plenty of time to finish the fight. Another use for B-Flow I've really come to appreciate is dragging Berger through trees. With the extra speed, I'm able to have him charge much faster before he catches up and does the ground pound. Wellington takes all the bites from the birch nutters, so I save on healing and armor as well. So I had a string of late game goofs this year. I wanted to whack some giant carrots to decorate the sinkhole build, and I didn't realize until after planting the seeds that my watering can was empty. I didn't want to run to the pond and risk the plants growing a phase without water, so I tried starting rain with my telelocate. Staff. I know that the casts increase the moisture of the world, but don't always guarantee rain, so sometimes you gotta cast a few times to get the rain started. I cast it four times before I got rain. So great, the crops are watered now. But I completely forgot two things. First, you can refill a watering can with ice. Second, I had two telelocator foci completely gemmed up, and casting the staff used all six purple gems. This also means that I can't teleport to the looter island anymore. Something else I had planned to do. So I'm gonna have to put that all off until I have time to sail. It was not my proudest moment. So I'll keep focusing on the sinkhole build for now. I'm gonna wall off the entire back area of the build with thulacite walls and bronze fencing. I'm trying to keep with a color scheme that complements the rabbit hutches, so I think different hues of yellow will work nicely here. And the sad end to the story of the seven wasted purple gems was that it was all for naught. We got a weed in the garden, so none of the carrots grew to be giants. We may have also missed a tending phase, just because I was away from the farm a little bit. I love the farms for planting and running when I'm busy, but I forgot how much attention they need if you actually want giants. You can't really make plans to go anywhere for longer than like half a day. If the friendly fruit fly ever decided to tend while unloaded, I would not complain. Okay, the back walls and fences are finished, and I'm sweeping some of the moon rock walls in front of the rabbit hutches. I think for default height, I actually like the default skin better than the Victorian. It feels a little less incomplete to me. With wall skins in particular, it is so nice to have skin variety for the different height levels. For instance, with Thulacite walls, I like the archive skin for default height the Victorian skin if I upgrade it once, and the Archive for the max height. I'm bringing those antlion boulders over to the Hound Trap. 
and they seem to fit well around the cave rock turf. I just need to be careful to not block hounds from reaching the statues during hound waves, but for now, they work as some non-flammable decor. And finally, we get some giant carrots. I'm gonna wax them all and use Wellington to transport them down to the sinkhole. I feel like having a domesticated beefalo has really opened up a ton of building potential when it comes to moving around statues, glass castles, boulders, and giant crops around to my different builds. I wanted to decorate the sinkhole with a kingly and a queenly statue. I used to have the sketches for them, but I suffered from the bug in the March quality of life beta that turned all my sketches into pond sketches. All of them. So I don't have those two anymore, among others. Now, I know you can get the sketches from Tumbleweeds once you destroy the marble sculptures, but it's like a one in 1,000 chance. And considering I lost the sketches to a bug, I don't feel like I deserve to spend an entire winter digging through Tumbleweeds. So I'm gonna grab those two sketches from my loot world. I just need to find the sculptures and mine them. Maxwell's statue was easy to find, but the queenly sketch took a bit of exploring. I finally found her in the rocky biome, at the set piece containing all three suspicious sculptures. Does she always spawn here? Cause that would be good to know for the future. And finally, I'm back home and moving my well-deserved decor into place. Now it's time to go sailing. There's a boat off the coast of the Mosaic, but I'm not sure how well equipped it is. So I'm bringing a few extra boat materials in case I want to add an extra sail or give it lightning protection. I'm also carrying two sunfish so that I can stay warm without the need for a fire pit on the boat. I'll just build a tin fishing bin and keep them in there. Turns out the boat is actually in decent shape, so I'm just going to leave the extra materials near the coast. I will definitely use them next time I forget to gem up my telelocator. On the lunar island, I'm chopping some trees and killing the moon moths for wings. I want to make some more lunar essence for a few things, and I need wings to make it. Then I'm gemming up the focus and sailing back. If I tell a locate back, then I'd have yet another extra boat at the lunar island that will never get used, so I'll just sail. And on the way back, I'm using the trident to clear out a few sea stacks between mosaic and lunar. It's nice to be able to clear a path this way and it's a fitting perk for a late game item. Now all we need is a way to spawn new sea stacks in the ocean. Kind of like how you can plant your own coral reefs in Shipwrecked. I return triumphant from my sailing and run straight over to the Mad Science Lab to craft up my well-earned Lunar Essence. Except, there's another ingredient I forgot about. Loon Tree Blossoms. The potion needs blossoms. I used all my blossoms on bath bombs. Now you might be thinking, Jazzy, you have Loon Trees at your base. Why would you go all the way to Lunar Island to chop trees? And you know what? I started asking myself the same question right around this time. The only time I should ever need to go to the Lunar Island is to craft at the altar. I don't need to waste six purple gems every time I want to go chop trees. So let's not anymore. Maybe I'll start incorporating Loon Trees into some of my paths and just chop and replant some of those when I need blossoms or moths. Because this is frankly an embarrassing misuse of rare items. And that's coming from a guy who feeds eyeballs to his dog. Okay, so here's why I wanted the Lunar Essence so badly. I'm gonna use it on some carrots to spawn carats. And positioning these on the ground is actually really easy. You just put a seed on the ground where you want them to burrow. Mutate a carrot, let them run to the seed and eat it. Bam, carrot decor. It's the absolute perfect complement to a bunny man build. I'm really proud of this build, by the way. It took a bit of adventuring and was fairly expensive, but at the end of the day, I get to see this beautiful set piece every time I go down to the caves or to my loot world, so time well spent. Now, I'm going to clear the ruins this year, but first, I'm making a preliminary trip to set up a little outpost for myself close to the ruins. Before heading down, I'm going to catch a canary and bring it downstairs to poison in a birdcage. I may have deconstructed all my knapsacks before making more, so in order to keep duplicating shroom skins, I need another poison canary. I'm going to build some mushroom planters at my outpost. This will be for growing blue mushrooms, which I can use to heal Wellington while we're down here. So I'm grabbing a few from the mush tree forest just to seed the planters. I could make a fun cap and catch the spores, but I didn't think to bring down any silk. Honestly though, if I set up like eight planters, I'm not gonna need to maximize harvests. So I'd prefer to just keep the setup on the simple side. I'm setting up the outpost right between the light bulb and lichen fields. 
Once you get into the lichen, there's the threat of worms, which have killed many a beefalo. Besides, the trip will be much shorter now that we're riding into the ruins, so I don't mind setting up shop a bit out of harm's way. Okay, the outpost is built. I'm gonna go back upstairs for a few days and make preparations for summer, make the knapsacks from the canary, and cook up a bunch of food. And then I'm heading straight for Fuel Weaver. I'm not gonna use Wellington for the fight though. My strategy relies a lot on tanking, and a B-Flow will not do well taking that much damage without stopping to heal him, and it takes a lot of time to heal a B-Flow. Plus, it's not necessary. I can kill Fuel Weaver in two minutes with Warly, so why would I risk losing my B-Flow here? By the way, this was definitely one of my faster Fuel Weaver kills. I was about three hits away from killing him before he threw up his second shield. And I'll bet next time I can get him before he does it. I just need to be able to start wailing on him as soon as the first shield goes down. Okay, ruins are reset. I'm gonna get back to Wellington over at the station. We need to go pick up some blue caps from the planters and then we can start to clear. First stop is Ancient Guardian. Now, I brought both saddles to this fight because DPS really does matter in this fight. Since you can only hit two to three times each charge, the fight can really wear on if you're not hitting hard. So I'm trying out the War Saddle first, and it's hard going. Because of the lost speed, I'm having a really hard time getting in even two hits per charge. So I switched to the Glossmer Saddle and it made a huge difference. I can easily do two hits with this speed. And as a result, my damage output is actually higher. Think about it. Wellington with a War Saddle hits once for 66 damage, but with the Glossmer Saddle hits twice for 100 damage. I'd imagine we get a similar result from other bosses where the kiting window is much smaller. For example, with Deerclops, we can headbutt three times with the Glossmer Saddle for 150, or twice with the War Saddle for 132. These are the kind of experiments I'm excited to run with these boss fights, and definitely let me know what configuration of saddles you like using for the different bosses. I need to leave Wellington outside of the labyrinth while I telepoof around and open up all the chests. I'm very thankful for the bell. It makes leaving Beefalo somewhere much more manageable. Now I just need to get better at remembering to pick it up. Clearing my first ruins with the B-Flow was really fun. I gotta say, nothing beats the satisfaction of actually dodging a bishop laser while riding around. I'm still wearing bone armor because bishop projectiles can still hurt me, but the B-Flow takes the hits from rooks. I think that as long as I'm riding the B-Flow, the rook only hurts for 45, but I need to be really careful dismounting because the Rook does 200 damage to mobs, and that includes Beeflo who are not being ridden by a player. I'm also making a point to remount before a Depths Worm wave. Domesticated Beeflo will still buck you after about 13 minutes, and if I get bucked during a Worm wave, then it's an almost guarantee that both me and the Beeflo will die. To be honest, the worms make me more nervous than any mob in the game now because they obliterate beefalo. So needless to say, I am very mindful of them when I hear them growling. But yeah, we cleared out the clockworks with Wellington. Then I parked him at a station while I spent a couple days hammering and mining everything. On the way out, I set up a handful of astral detectors at the outpost. It's a small enough build that I think we can get by with six of these. Mush lights would have been an okay choice here too, especially since we're so close to the light bulb field. But I brought moon rock, not shroom skin. Spending the last few days of summer back upstairs fishing at the oasis. I still like getting festive lights this way, but I'm curious how much of this I'm gonna do once we get the eye of the storm update. I'm really excited to start farming enlightened shards for my glow caps, but I imagine for this world, I'll continue to use a combination of festive lights and shards. We'll see. Ending the year with a chaotic claws fight. Replete with firehounds. This loot stash is right on the road, so I'm definitely blocking this spawner. Once we pick a final spot for Kloss to spawn, we're gonna need to clear a large area around it, just to make sure we don't get fire spreading to nearby builds. But that's it for year 28. Join me next time for the final recap of the series. We're gonna continue building around the Moonstone, clearing out more area, and getting ready for the day 2000 base tour. Hope you're enjoying the recaps, and maybe we can catch you live next time over on Twitch. Take care.